<laughs> no, nobody was listening to that. Okay. Okay, so sorry, everyone. <laughs> Apparently, the diffusion had not started. And so I was talking with Louis for 15 minutes with no one watching. I'm absolutely horrified about this. So let's restart. And thank you and welcome for to join us for this first uh, expert AMA of Colonized Mars. So if it's your first time, I'm Stephanie. I'm the community manager of uh, Colonized Mars, and I'm absolutely ashamed of myself today and i have the the pleasure to i had a few minutes ago and i will again uh interrogate uh well interrogate ask questions to uh louis neil erwin which is who is uh, a renowned and very experienced with a long career of research in neurobiology evolution and astrobiology and so let's restart and invite again louis to join me, I, I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm absolutely sorry to no everyone. Problem. I was not looking at the chat and I did not realize that it was not started. So, uh, well, Louis, so I'm just gonna restart the first question I asked you a few minutes okay. ago. So could you present sure. yourself and tell the community mm -hmm. who you are? Sure. I'm Louis Irwin. I am a retired uh, college professor with a career in biology, specifically in uh, neurobiology and astrobiology. I was trained as a, as a physiologist and a biochemist. Uh, most of my research career was, st was spent studying uh, neurochemical aspects of brain function and more recently has involved a movement into study of cognition, cognition, intelligence, and technology development. Uh, about 20 years ago, I entered the field of astrobiology with a colleague. Um, and uh, this was at the time that astrobiology was becoming recognized uh, in the United States, under that term, it existed worldwide uh, in, in Europe and in Asia as exobiology. They're basically the same thing. And uh, I have <clears throat> continued to work in that field for the last 20 years as well. Okay, thanks. And so, uh... Once again, <laughs> what do you do as an astrobiologist? Astrobiology really has three components. One is the study of organisms on Earth in analog environments, that is, environments that are similar to what we think exists on other planetary bodies. Um, <clears throat> that generates actual data that people can used to surmise the pl plausibility of life existing under those actual conditions on other worlds. The second branch is a direct exploration of other worlds, which, which as of today, as of yet, is just done remotely uh, through uh, robots and, um, and remote uh, sensing <clears throat> instruments. And the third aspect is the development of models and theories based on what we hope are reasonable assumptions about life and extrapolating from that how we think life may have originated on other worlds, how it may have evolved, and what it's like today, and what it could become like in the future. Great. And uh, during your career, what was the most interesting thing you did as an astrobiologist mm -hmm. or the most interesting thing you discovered? The most interesting thing I've done is uh, travel with another group of astrobiologists to the north slope of Alaska. <clears throat> uh, spending time in Barrow, Alaska, studying the sea ice up there in the Arctic Ocean, and uh, just thinking about uh, 
the Arctic environment as an analog for ice-covered uh, worlds in our solar system like Europa and Enceladus. The most interesting thing I've discovered is, uh, let, me, let me say that I have, uh, my colleague and I have brought biology into the field of astrobiology. Most current astrobiologists come to it from planetary science, astrophysics, and geology. Uh, they are not strong on biology, but that is our strong suit. And we have tried to uh, go beyond the simple question of, is there life on Mars, which is about as far as a lot of astrobiologists get, to what could that life be like? How could it, it have gotten to the point that it has arrived at? And uh, what might it be like today? So in terms of what we discovered, we discovered that if we make plausible assumptions, we can model complex ecosystems on other worlds, especially in environments such as subsurface oceans. Uh, but equally in environments um, like uh, the lava tube caves on Mars, uh, I have actually modeled what a uh, moderately complex ecosystem might look like there. And then uh, astrobiology has given me the opportunity to think uh, deeply about what comes after the present. In other words, given the trajectory that we are on, what will become of our uh, evolutionary future, technologically and intellectually, and then applying that to other worlds, given how life may have evolved on other worlds, what are the plausible consequences for complex life, for complex uh, information processing, including intelligent life and technology on those other worlds? Those are all issues that most astrobiologists don't deal with. And it's something that uh, my my close colleague, uh, Dirk schultz Bakush and I have concentrated on. Thanks. And what do you, what thing would you still want to discover at this point? I would like to know if there are microorganisms in the uh, water, in the sulfuric acid droplets of the clouds of Venus. I would like to know what life exists, if any does, on Mars in its different environments, that is, its subterranean environments, uh, in its uh, uh, lithosphere, that is, uh, cryptoorganisms, organisms that exist inside rocks. Uh, or soil substances, what they might be like, and then what life might be like in the two other uh, more exotic environments that are not usually dealt with. One would be the possibility of liquid brine lakes beneath the ice caps at the poles, uh, evidence for which has been claimed, still a little controversial, and, and the other unusual environment is cave life uh, that it could exist in the lava tubes on Mars, uh, just uh, as it does on Earth, where it's very different from life on the outside. Perhaps there is life in the, in the lava tube caves of Mars that is uh, different from what may exist outside on Mars. Okay, so thanks. So now let's go to the community questions. 
And so the first one is, so most eyes seems to be on Mars when we say that we are looking for extraterrestrial life. Uh, with the news that water uh, exists, that there was water on the planet in the past, do you think any life still exists there? Uh, yes, I think that the chances of life existing on Mars are reasonably good. If I had to put a number on it, I would say 50-50 chance that microbial life exists probably on the subsurface of Mars, possibly uh, lithospherically, that is within the rocks of Mars, like some microbes exist in Antarctica uh, on Earth. Um, and with regard to more complex life, uh, like ground covered mosses or uh, uh, protists like amoebas, the paramecia, that type of thing, in small uh, liquefied pockets uh, beneath the surface. You know, I would have to rate that down. Why not give it a number? Let's say 20% chance. But those are just obviously wild guesses. But bottom line, yes, I think the chances are decent that some life exists on Mars. And so except for the existence of water, uh, what on Mars would make it possible to contain life, for, make it possible for Mars to contain life? Right. Uh, water is, is certainly the main uh, advantage that Mars has going for it in terms of supporting life. Uh, temperature is a second factor, although it's very, very cold on Mars, the differential between the temperature on Mars and Earth is less than it is on any other planetary body in our solar system. So at certain times of year, certain times of day, uh, certain uh, latitudes, on Mars, the temperature actually gets a little bit above zero, a little bit above zero centigrade, a little bit above the boiling point of water uh, right at the surface. So it is uh, not at all comfortable. Uh, you wouldn't be able to walk around in a T-shirt, but uh, with the proper equipment, we can move around fairly easily on Mars. Uh, that's the third thing. It is a solid substrate, so it makes exploring across the surface, walking or roaming on rovers uh, easy. And then the fourth thing is the atmosphere of Mars. It's very thin, but there is an atmosphere uh, sufficiently dense for us to fly helicopter-like drones in the atmosphere. So all of those things provide us with an environment that our technology on Earth is familiar with and could be adapted to the um, exploration of Mars. Thanks. And sorry again to make you go back to those questions again. Um, and OK, what tools would scientists on Earth need to ship to Mars that haven't been sent yet? We've already sent uh, <clears throat> geological harvesting equipment like drillers. We've sent some uh, fairly simple chemical analytical instruments, uh, some uh, gas chromata chromatographs, for instance, and we have sent microscopes <clears throat> on uh, current rovers, but <clears throat> we need much more sophisticated chemical instrumentation. Uh, we need microscopes that are higher power that can be manipulated in real time by operators. And <clears throat> then we clearly need uh, power supplies, ways of generating or harvesting uh, endogenous energy or energy sources on Mars. I'm 
I know those are contemplated. I just don't know exactly what they are, but we would certainly need those things. Uh, ability to generate power, the ability to examine uh, microscopic detail, and <clears throat> the ability to do sophisticated chemical analysis. I can't hear you, Stephanie. Sorry. Um, <laughs> I was okay. saying, so that brings Thank us you. to the next questions, uh, which is with the current equipments and facilities that colonize Mars okay. is sent on Mars in the game, what else needs to be sent to ensure that studies and research are done accurately? Uh, this, is, this is the same question I just answered, right? Yeah, yeah you, you, you answered a part of it. I think you know, about the energy and so on. Uh, did you touch on everything? I think that do you took do spoke uh, about the tools that should be sent? Okay. That yeah. do you want me to answer that question again? Uh, the, the current equipment. Uh, what needs to be sent to ensure studies or research are done accurately? um just more sophisticated versions of what we already have there yeah sorry that's for me and did you had already inserted everything um yeah. that's not my day okay so next question um so perseverance is currently taking sample in tubes to for a return trip to earth uh, would you know the possibility to that whatever life is inside that tubes, those tubes, would die before the any space agency gets it back to Earth? The sample collection uh, protocols for the Perseverance mission uh, are not an attempt to return living organisms to Earth. They're designed to return soil samples and rock samples for detailed chemical analysis mainly. Um, it is possible that some cryptoorganisms, organisms that are uh, microbial sequestered inside solid rock or minerals <clears throat> or spores which can survive for extended periods of time uh, essentially in a totally quiescent, uh, non-metabolizing uh, state, those conceivably could survive uh, until we get the tubes back to Earth. But I don't think uh, we would expect to open up the tube and find anything crawling around in there. Yes, indeed. Uh, yes, so I'm not muted. No, okay, I'm not muted this time. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yeah, so uh, yes, how much credence do you give right now to the idea that life on Earth actually originated from Mars and what kind of evidence would help to definitely settle the question? You know, when I started out in astrobiology, I thought uh, that the transfer of life, interplanetary transfer of life was uh, not at all likely. Uh, now, however, we know that a lot of material has gotten from Mars to Earth. Uh, we have scores of mineral samples from Mars, so we know that uh, there is exchange of inorganic material at least, uh, if that inorganic material contains sequestered microorganisms, it's possible that life could be transferred from one form, from, from one planet to another. Certainly in the early planetary history of both Mars and Earth, uh, which formed roughly the same time, and probably were more similar 
uh, geophysically. Uh, life could have evolved on one of those planets first and been transferred to the other. Um, so I think the possibility is greater now than I once thought it was. I still think it's fairly low. In terms of the evidence that would help us settle that question, if we obtain samples from Mars, including samples that would be returned in those tubes uh, being deposited now by the Persever and the Perseverance mission, um, if we found amino acids similar to amino acids that we have on Earth, if we found carbohydrates similar to the carbohydrates on Earth, then more significantly, if we found that all the amino acids were left-handed, if we found all the carbohydrates were right-handed, the way both of those element, both of those uh, compounds exist on Earth, that would be strong indication that there was a common origin between the two planets. Uh, now, it could go either way. It could have originated on Earth and gone to Mars. It could have originated on Mars and come to Earth. The planet would have, that would have the greatest variety of those molecules, say the greatest variety of amino acids, there are about 20 on Earth. Uh, if we found 30 amino acids on Mars, that would indicate that life probably had a head start on that on earth if we find only 10 amino acids on mars compared to 20 on earth that would indicate that earth got a head start on mars and sent life in the other direction okay interesting so one direction or one another okay. right yes um okay so do you think that humans uh can survive on mass based on the current information we have about the environment and what are the positive signs that it would be possible uh it depends on what you mean by survive um humans can survive in much under much harsher conditions on the moon so we know that for at least a few hours a properly outfitted human can survive on the moon, so they certainly could survive on Mars. If you mean for days or weeks at a time, certainly if we have the proper uh, environmental equipment, by that I mean uh, pressurized living habitats and pressure suits for wearing uh, outside the pressurized uh, habitations, uh, then we could, then humans could survive as long as whatever food supply they have and whatever oxygen supply they can uh, take. If you mean indefinite survival as a, a long-term colony on Mars, uh, we uh, humans could survive as long as they stay inside those those uh, <clears throat> artificial artificially inflated habitations as long as they wear their pressure suits on the outside and as long as the colony can generate oxygen and generate uh, nutrients to survive, then humans could survive indefinitely. If you mean, can we leave our pressurized habitats and go walking around the surface in our uh, shirt sleeves? Uh, no, that's not going to be possible. We can't survive in the low atmosphere of Mars. Sorry. <laughs> okay. Sorry. Uh, okay, next question. And that's a question from uh, John John from our community. I recognize that. So are there any potential solutions to combat or to reduce the effects of reduced gravity on humans? <clears throat> to a certain extent, we could combat the uh, muscle weakness that would accompany 
uh, lower gravity on Mars just by inserting weights into our clothing and walking around with uh, those weights that would bring our uh, weight back to what is comparable on Earth. That would that would deal with the muscle physiology. As far as other organ physiology, uh, that would not be affected so much. And so we would have to be concerned about long-term effects of reduced gravity on uh, organ systems in our bodies. Uh, but I would say when I, if I were going to Mars and I first got there, I would uh, find it a blast to be in a much lower gravity because I could hop around <laughs> and jump higher and run further and, uh, throw harder uh, than I could on Earth, and uh, that would be fun to frolic to frolic around in for a while. I think. Uh, so, <clears throat> yeah, we can we can uh, reduce the effects of gravity by carrying weights around. Uh, I'm not sure how much we want to do that. We have astronauts and cosmonauts who survive for over a year in space in zero gravity. So uh, that is much less a serious problem physiologically than the lack of oxygen and the lack of atmospheric pressure. Yeah, so the lack of oxygen would not last long. <laughs> no, that, that's, a, that's a rate limiting factor there. So uh, we have to, I would be interested to know what the plans are for colonized. I don't know enough about colonized Mars to know how it, how the colonizers expect to generate oxygen. I would be interested in that. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, and that, but that's mm -hmm. the question of oxygen brings us to the next question, which is, which is, how do you think the Martian atmosphere would affect plants and microorganisms and humans? and maybe cause possible new disease? Uh, <clears throat> plants apparently cannot exist. Plants as we know them cannot survive in the Martian atmosphere because we've taken thousands of images of the surface of Mars and not one has ever disclosed anything like a plant as we know it. So. The answer there is negative. Plants cannot survive in that atmosphere. Plants presumably could certainly survive in pressurized greenhouses. Um, and I'm sure that that's, that is what the first colonists would plan to do. How would the atmosphere affect humans? Well, as I've already indicated, uh, uh, an unpressurized human body uh, won't survive more than uh, 90 seconds or so uh, without higher pressure because the highest atmospheric pressure on Mars is about six times lower than the lowest uh, pressure that humans can survive on Earth. So... <clears throat> Uh, as I say, humans without protective pressurized equipment cannot survive in the Martian atmosphere. Uh, <clears throat> over a longer term, uh, and I guess morphing into the answer about disease, uh, there are, uh, well, I'm sorry, let me go back to, can microorganisms survive? Yes, probably. Uh, because we have my, we have microorganisms that uh, can uh, survive under very extreme conditions on Earth, conditions that are found on Mars. Now, the possibility of disease, disease comes in uh, basically two forms, those that are caused by pathogens like bacteria and viruses, and those that uh, represent physiological failures like like compromised organ function. With regard to the first pathogen caused diseases, I'm 
just not as concerned about that as a lot of people seem to be because the evolution of life on Mars and Earth has been separated for so long that it is, seems very unlikely to me that organisms would have evolved on Mars that would be sustainable inside the bodies of organisms that evolved on Earth. Uh, not certainly not impossible, but uh, it seems to me unlikely. Uh, however, the physiological failure of our organ systems is uh, much more plausible, but we don't know what the long-term uh, trajectory would be for uh, organ physiology on Mars. Now, we do know from, again, uh, astronauts and cosmonauts who've lived in space for for a year and a half or so, uh, come back to Earth. Uh, they're extremely weak in, in terms of muscles, but their organs seem to survive okay. We just don't know what the very long-term effects would be on, say, the ability of the thyroid to secrete thyroxin or the pancreas to secrete insulin or the kidneys to filter our blood properly or the liver to uh, carry out the metabolic conversions that are necessary to keep us alive. We just don't know about that. But uh, we do at least have the experience of having long-term space residents in zero gravity uh, returning to Earth and surviving uh, and recovering well. Okay. And what are your thoughts about terraforming Mars, so transforming it so it would be more comfortable for humans, I would say, and yeah. for life. The technology for terraforming, as I understand it, would take uh, centuries, if not thousands of years. So in the short run, terraforming is just not uh, a plausible uh, uh technology for implementing on Mars. As far as the ethics of terraforming long term, uh, I personally don't have a problem with it. Uh, we have terraformed Earth, if you will, I mean, by drastically altering its natural uh, surface and conditions. Uh, and I see no reason why the same wouldn't or couldn't be something that could be accomplished on Mars, but it's not something that's going to be accomplished within our lifetimes or probably within a thousand years by which we may or may not still exist as a species. I hope we still will. <laughs> <laughs> crossing fingers uh, so, and when we do find life on Mars, what's the next step what's next well that depends on whether you're a geologist or a biologist if you're a geologist you'll say oh bacteria how cool now let me go find some more rocks if you're a biologist however you really want to know what that life is like we want to know what its uh, chemical composition is uh, if its chemical composition is anything we recognize, we're going to want to know what that biochemistry looks like. We want to know how similar that biochemistry is to the biochemistry that we know about. We want to know um, what the uh, capabilities of those forms of life are. Uh, well, you know, how can it move around? It's... Uh, how does it uh, survive? What, what supports its energy metabolism in a, an environment that doesn't have the oxidizing power that oxygen provides for life on Earth? Uh, how do they reproduce? Just everything about them that would indicate to us 
what the probability is that uh, life is uniform more or less wherever it arises or how idiosyncratic it is every time it arises. In other words, how different it turns out to be whenever it arises. And now I have a few questions that are a little bit different uh, on other things than math and more generic, uh, more general. Uh, the first one being, how difficult is it to be an astrobiologist and study the possibility of life on other planets? Well, astrobiology is an unusual field in that it uh, presupposes a phenomenon that isn't known for certainty to even exist. So it's the study of the origin, uh, development, existence, and future of life on other worlds. And we have no certain known example of life on other worlds. So that means that the field of astrobiology can be one that you can just do pretty much anything you want to in uh, without fear of contradiction. <laughs> Uh, it is a very hand wavy type of field uh, filled with uh, people like me who don't even carry out experiments, but just uh, develop models and theories uh, uh, about what is plausible, what is possible, what is likely under different scenarios and that uh, plan for or suggest ways uh, that future missions should be carried out in order to accomplish whatever whatever goal we have, whether it's uh, discovering and characterizing life or understanding the, the geophysics of planetary formation or the uh, change in climate over time on other worlds that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. Yes. And then next question is, what can enthusiasts on Earth here uh, do if they want to help, if they want to help? Um, where can they start? <clears throat> uh, you know, the beautiful thing about having government, at least in the United States, do research is that all the products of that research is owned by all the citizens that the government uh, uh, is aligned with. So in other words, everything that NASA discovers is in the public domain. So you can go to appropriate internet sites and download all the images that NASA cameras have ever taken. Uh, you can access most of the data that instruments have collected. And depending on your level of technological uh, uh, capabilities, you can be a scientist yourself in your own living room. But if your question really goes more to the, the amateur scientist or the casual enthusiast, um, I would suggest uh, the place to start would be to go to the Jet Propulsion Lab website, jpl.nasa.gov. And most of the missions have uh, among the tabs that you can check on, like overview and mission and science objective and so forth they have a tab called participate and you can click on that and you can find a number of suggested activities most of these are designed for students for student school projects and that type of thing but amateur scientists could do them as well and become involved in um, doing the types of things that professional astrobiologists do. And then there are 
a number of other things. I mean, some of them trivial, like you can send your name to any planetary mission that NASA sends up. They give everybody an opportunity to put their name on something. You know, you can name a star if you go to the right internet site. There are plenty of stars, more stars than all the people in the world. Um, and uh, most of uh, the government uh, in, in the United States, and I, I'm sure this is true of the European Space Agency and the comparable Asian um, <clears throat> space agencies as well, they have uh, leads or links in, on their internet sites for people who uh, want to learn more or participate more casually in um, astrobiology. When I taught at the University of Texas at El Paso, I taught a course with undergraduates and we, per we partnered with Arizona State University in their uh, student imaging project. We actually went to Tempe, Arizona spent a week there downloading images from the Odyssey orbiter, which were just for us. Uh, we could ask the orbiter to take a picture of such and such a, uh, a site. So uh, you could uh, do this. I imagine Colonize Mars could, I'm sure you already, I know you already have images of the Colonize Mars landing site, but you could ask for a close-up image of any other site on Mars as well. And you could download that and you could become an armchair, basement, uh, desktop scientist yourself. And we, our, our students did that. These were undergraduate students who examined the images very carefully and deduced things about the age of volcanism and the nature of the surface history of that part of the planet. So I would go to those websites, the government websites that nearly all, all have links to what the non-scientists can do to participate in the field. Great. I'm going to go and look at that after the, after the stream. And we are, we are already reaching the, the last one, which is, uh, what do you think about space tourism? So that's oh, really different. <laughs> I want to go. I think uh, space tourism is good, uh, uh, is great. I think, uh, I think the ability to expand our human experience, our, our knowledge uh, of uh, space is a positive thing. Um, ask the tourists who have gone, the small number who have gone, they come back. Uh, and they tell you that their their life looks different. Uh, you know, the world looks different just from spending a few minutes in space. So I think that that is uh, a positive thing. Uh, and as time goes on and it becomes more affordable, more people can do it. So I'm in favor of it. Great. Okay, well, thanks again, Luis. Uh, sorry for the little mess up where we started and then had to restart. Give me a chance to practice. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, and uh, yeah, for the, the people watching us, if you want to uh, take a look at the books of uh, Luis, I'm going to project here the page on his website where you can find them. So they are very interesting thing on cosmic biology and uh, other subject more on the neurobi neurobiology and your other uh, interest, which is involution, evolution. And uh, well, I'm gonna thank you again, Louis. Uh, that was very interesting, even with the little hiccups. And, uh, Thank I'm you. Wishing you uh, a nice day because I know for you it's still the morning. And uh, oh, sorry, <laughs> I invited by the cat in the last minute. And so uh, see you and thanks again. Bye bye. Okay. Thank you. Good luck with Colonize Mars. Thanks.